welcome to another edition of the Guna Ramble. I'm the host, Giles, and joining me today are the one and only Clive. How you doing, sir? You alright? I am fine, thank you. You Hello. were you were missed last week by all by by all um, reports from all of our two listeners. So I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll be over the moon to have you back. <laughs> I appreciate that. Boost to my confidence. <laughs> and also joining me uh, today is my drinking buddy and forthright gooner. He's always gunning for gooners, not in the way that you may think, but he is gunning. <laughs> For the Gooners, and he gets a bit between his teeth. He's marking. How are you doing, mate? <laughs> I'm all right, Charles. Please, please do not be associating me with any shizer like that that, <laughs> that comes out from anywhere, please. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. <laughs> all right, yeah. So uh, let's progress crack on. Um, nil, nil, nil or draw in the FA Cup. And um, the uh, draw has just been made for the quarterfinals. I think if we prevail against Hull, we've got uh, West Ham. No, Watford at home, another home tie, if we prevail. Um, yesterday's game, for me, a bit tepid, a bit turgy. I think in the first half, I may have even fallen into sleep at certain points. It was so, so predictable and pedestrian. Second half was a bit better. Loads of shots on goals. I mean, if you look at the shots on goals, for the last how many games, we've, we've I, think, I think I saw a stat that said we've had over 100 shots of goal in the last seven games which is crazy. We've only scored six goals in those seven games since the 3-3 at Liverpool. Clive, you looked at it, you studied it. What did you make of the game? Well, it felt like it fell out after Lord Mayor's show at the start. I mean, I'd never seen the ground so quiet in all of my days, right? So um, the Leicester game, you know, I've never seen it so euphoric. And then we come into this game, it just felt really, really flat, right? So, um, it, it just felt like a game we just had to get through. And the players sort of started a little bit sort of in the same way, right? They didn't really... We've got a bit of an issue with how we start games. And uh, we've seen many first halves sort of just go by us. And the second half comes and we're having to react to how poorly we played in the first half. You know, it, it's just a, it was just a flat, flat start. And it didn't inspire. We were going for the motions, but it was just a little bit slow. The ball movement was a little bit... Um, sort of sluggish the players are doing the right patterns but when you go slow i don't think you're stretching teams enough and you know a lot of you know they're even though Hull are a championship team physically they're quite strong they're quite big and they get to play above themselves so um i felt we didn't quite move them around didn't get the break of the early penalty and then um we ended up struggling so that was it really uh, Mark, um, the, the lineup. Even even if we play a second team, we've got to be a scratch hole team, haven't we? You know, you know, people were saying our perspective. We were unlucky. On another day, we would have, the goals would have gone in. It's a fourth game where a goalkeeper had a you know a day of his life. Uh, how did you? How would you um, review that assist? That? I mean, I, I'm I, I'm got much of a problem with the team he's put out because you know I understand why he needs to rest players you know, and, and we can't be hypocritical. You know, we say to him he's got to rotate players and he's got to rest them and and that and there's certain players that you sort of think will need a rest. You know, Ramsey puts a lot of effort in, uh, Ozil puts a lot, a lot of effort in, and uh, I absolutely no problem with that. You, and you expect that a team with the quality that we had in it uh, against Hull at home is is good enough to get the job done. Particularly, then you see that Hull uh, focusing on their uh, challenge for, for for the yeah. championship promotion rested a, a lot of their players, you know, and had a lot of changes. So you sort of think we should be able to do it, and then and you also what you want to see is you want to see that some of these guys that are, are playing for us yesterday, you want to see that they're chomping at the bit to 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 show Wenger that actually, you know what, I should be in your first team every week. Um, and then you, you watch, you know, you look at it and you think, as Clive says, when it's so slow in that first half, I mean, it was really, that was a really dire half of football. It was awful. And the other thing you've got to think about is the atmosphere. Now, again, it's, it's chicken and egg. You know, is the atmosphere so bad because the football's so shit? Or, or is, are the players finding it hard to, to kind of get up because there's no, no geeing up for, coming from the fans? It's um it's a difficult question, you know, and and I don't know. I mean, I, you've seen this season for me has been the worst season for atmosphere at the Emirates. It's been absolutely terrible in a lot of games, and I find that if if we're not playing 
uh, either a, a local rival or a, a, a rival that we're challenging, or you know it's a game that's really really important that we do something in, then the fans are all kind of like sitting there having a chat about last night's telly and, and all shit like that, and they're not you know they're not picking up the team and they're waiting for the team to do something, and whether that's right or wrong, I'm not too sure, but it, it was it was it was dreadful. It really was. I mean, as I said, I was, I was, I think I was daydreaming through half of some of the first half. Um, we'll return to the the atmosphere in ticketing and, and, and so and so on later in the program. But uh, Clive, the people were saying, I saw people saying that, oh, you know, Hull had no ambition. They didn't play like Burnley, and I was thinking, well, why should they play like Burnley? They saw that Burnley came out to play us, and they got they got beat. So why would you go out and try and replicate what Burnley did? You know, if you want to try and get further in the FA Cup, obviously you're gonna you're going to sit deep. What well, they did was they sat deep and they, they they made it narrow, didn't they? And they, made, they allowed us to play wide because, you know, we didn't really have, we weren't really penetrating them going wide. We didn't get in behind them. So they were happy, as far as I could see, to play their game. I think they even played with three centre-halves against, the, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a changing, a changing formation of Danny Welbeck and, and uh, Phil Walker up front, but I, I didn't. I didn't think there was much wrong with the side. Right, there's one thing that did sort of uh, stand out to me when I saw the formation. I saw Welbeck left and Campbell right, and Walker down the middle. My first feeling was, I'm not sure about that. I, I wanted Danny Welbeck to play centre forward more, uh, although he did well and he, you know, gave a great performance and been out for ten months. I, I just felt that we lacked a bit of presence and, and Theo was bright early, was moving, but once they got, once we got hold of the ball, once we'd like controlled the centre of the pitch and we started to go through our patterns, we're then looking for a centre forward presence off a cross ball and that isn't Theo's game, right? So um, I think they did shuffle around a bit later on, but I would have started Welbeck as centre forward just yeah. for some physicality against you know those championship centre backs who are a bit lumpy, right? I would have just had him there and it would have maybe given us another option. I do think Arsenal have been really good at what I call chance creation. I'm loving these diagonals over the top to players running in. But you know one of the main players for doing that were the two main players for those diagonals are Urza and Sanchez. And they both didn't play, right? So I felt our chance creation, even though it was good, it wasn't the type of chances we're making in league games. And uh, it's, it's not much criticism. I thought we were better in this game than we were, say, Southampton nil nil. I thought it was a lot more conviction on our finishing, and I felt we were unluckier. I thought the goalkeeper had a world here, and we were much more unlucky than versus Southampton, where I felt our finishing was sloppy and lacked conviction. Mark, Clive says that the goalkeeper had a world here. A lot of people had him down as a man of the match. Were a lot of those chances really that? great i mean a lot of them seem to be kind of in his in his wingspan if you want you know um there's only a few i think maybe i think the for me campbell shot we tipped it onto the post was a great save um and i'm struggling to think of any others that really stretched him i don't know what 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 did you think well yeah i agree i mean the campbell one where he's got fingertips on it onto the post was was a was a great save. The uh, I think the one from Welbeck was a much better save than I thought it was at the time. When I saw it last night, I thought it was a it was a much better save because it it kind of come come through a crowd of players. And although he knew exactly what Welbeck was trying to do, you know, he's got a cross and and he saved it well. The other all the other saves were a bit you know the the one from the free kick off Sanchez at the end. They were they were saves I'd be really disappointed if my keeper didn't make. So um, I'm not you know I'm not convinced he, he's, he's had the game of his life against us uh, in the same way that maybe you know Fraser Forster did so I think again it's 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 down to uh, a lot of it's down to finishing but it's also chance creation you know and I mean when you look at the when you look at the league table at home from the top seven sides only United have scored less goals at home than us you know but away away from home you know we're like the third third highest uh, goal scorer so you know I think the question is why are we seeming to struggle struggle so much to score goals at home um, and not necessarily away you know is it the style of football that we play away is more conducive to that whereas at home you know when the teams are sitting sitting those banks in front of their box you know are, are we struggling and the one thing and we spoke about it yesterday is as soon as you take uh, Ozil out of the team there's very very little creativity um, and that that that's a real concern to me. That is is if we lose, if we were to lose Özil at all, I, I would I would struggle to see how we would create as many sort of 
really, really good chances as we, we do. It was interesting because I was watching yesterday and I, I was looking at the middle of the park and I was thinking, who's the man that facilitates, is going to facilitate, who's the man that's going to you know, conjure those openings? And I can only see really Iwobi, who played quite well, I thought. You know, he did his bit, he, did his, he, he tried, um, but there wasn't really much else. I mean, in the middle of the park, El, El Nene and, and Flamini, did they really give that much going forward? I know some people, I think I was talking to Invincible Paul yesterday, and he said that, you know, although El Nene didn't really do much going through the middle, he, he was spreading the diagonals. And I was thinking, yeah, but we weren't doing anything with the diagonals. There wasn't no... You know, there wasn't enough zip. There wasn't enough pace on the ball. Clive, you've spoken in the past about moving the ball quickly. You know, yeah, uh, moving the ball quickly is really important because what you're doing is you're giving the person who's receiving the ball an extra half yard, and that means he can do his stuff and move away. You can create that sort of, well, I call it like a, a triangle to offense, right? Where you cut back against the grain, and you're just creating movement and moving players around. My issue really is, I, I, I don't think it's a problem in creating chances. But if you look at the front three, right, just look at them. I mean, Walcott, how many goals has he scored this season? What, three or four? Welbeck, been out for 10 months. And Campbell, is he a goal scorer or a goal maker? Right, so we've got all of these chance creation and solidity. But really, we're looking at our fullbacks to really break them open. You know, one of our fullbacks is really a debate whether he's a centre half or a centre midfielder, right? So mm. I, I think... Chance creation is good, but it's it's, it's it's conviction and quality of finishing. Right? We've had 20 plus shots, right? but you make a good point. How many of those did you feel in your stomach that was really going to go in? Right? Maybe a couple of deflections could have gone away. What we needed was that early penalty, right? Yeah. That early yeah. penalty goes in. It's one nil after 15 minutes and that game is completely different. Right? And I think the less, if there's a lesson, and we've got to learn it quick. We've got to be better in the first 15 minutes, right? Because that can set the tone of the game. And this is not the first time it's happened. I'm not, I'm not massively critical of them. I just think we are not scoring enough goals. And I think it's not that when we are making enough chances, we are not scoring enough goals. It's our conversion rate that's really poor rather than our chance creation. And, and that's been quite simple. As I said, you know, the last six, seven games has been pretty poor in terms of conversion rates. Um, so whether it's Danny Welbeck or or Phil Walcott or our main guy, Olivier Giroud, we're not tucking them away. We're not sticking them in. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. That it is a worrying statistic going forward. When will we get our mojo back in terms of, you know, um, putting teams to bed? I mean, obviously, we, we you know, we've got the win at Leicester last weekend and obviously we've got Barcelona coming up on Tuesday and then, We've got, oh, my memory escapes me, is it West Brom? I don't know, who we got on Saturday? Sunday, no, we've got United. Man United, don't we? Man United. <laughs> Man United next weekend. So, do you, are you confident that we will get our mojo back in terms of converting these chances that we've been creating, Clive? Oh, I'm, I'm not. Right? I'm confident we're going to play well. But I, I can't tell you where the goal's coming from. I mean, Giroud, you know, Giroud's a player that we've criticised over the recent seasons. I tell you what, he's he's carrying the team goal scoring wise this season, without a doubt. And um, and if there was one worry yesterday, the couple of little things that worried me, but the the one worry really was Alexis Sanchez, right? He, he's come on, and he is that person that can take a half chance or create his own chance. And he has not performed really consistently this season and given us that extra. And if we're going to do anything, we really need him. We, we need him to find his legs again, to find his form, to get that fear factor back. And at the moment, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, yeah, you're, you're struggling a little bit. And we need you back, back because we're getting into the money months. And, um, and he's not quite there. Mark, you said that we're, we're third one of the top in terms of um, scoring away from home this season, do you think that are you confident that we'll get, you know, we'll get, we'll kickstart and continue starting from Manchester United next week? Well, I think we need to. I mean, the thing is, you look at the six away games we've got left. You know, five of them are tough, tough away games. You know, you've got United, Spurs, West Ham, Everton, and uh, City. So you know, they're not five 
easy away games, regardless of how City and, and United have been performing of late. You know, they're tough. We, they're places, not necessarily uh, on paper, you'd look at them, but they're, they're places where we know psychologically sometimes we find it a little bit tough to go and get results from. You know, I mean, in all honesty, if you offered me a draw at Tottenham today, I'd, I'd snatch your hand off for it, to be fair, because, yeah. uh, you know, that it's, it's, those games are, it's their cup finals, which uh, is good, good for them, seeing as how they won't be fucking playing in any others. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm not sure. And I mean, I know that game, just, just to go back to the point Clive made about, he's not worried about the chance creativity. I think from my, what I meant by that was it's the the quality of the chance creativity, yeah, yeah. and I think the thing is yeah. that Ur, the chances that Urzel creates are, are far easier to convert than the other chances that we sometimes you know sort of manage to to, to to knock up from anywhere. And and I agree completely about his point with Giroud. I mean you know, and I know that Giroud still gets stick uh, all the week. You know, I got blocked. I got blocked by some other some fellow the other day because I stood up for Giroud, um, which was hilarious. But um, you know, it is that even when he's not scoring goals, you know, Giroud has created a goal for Urzil at Bournemouth. Giroud has created a goal for uh, Theo against oh, against Leicester. You know, I, I, Giroud and he and should have created that. a goal for Ox yesterday, shouldn't he? Right. Really, you know. So yeah. he is playing. I think he is playing well, and and we need him. And 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 yeah, certainly with Alexis who doesn't look. The Alexis of last year, um, which is hardly any wonder because the fella's been playing football non-stop for virtually two years and then gets injured. So, um, you know, he needs to play himself back in and his head, he, he looks like he's worrying about his form at the moment himself. Um, OK, a couple of quick, couple of individual performances. Camp, uh, Chambers down the right, didn't really convince for me. Steady at the back, didn't really offer much going forward. Kept on checking back. Not sure why that was. What did you guys make of it? I'll start with you, Mark. Um, oh, I think one of the problems for Chambers is that he's he's going to suffer in comparison there, so from a point of view of pace wise and the quality of 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 uh, ball, uh, mm. against Bellerin. You know, I mean, he he was uh, solid at the back. He, you know, he did everything you kind of wanted him to do as a as a as a right back going forward. Yeah, I mean, look, let's let's not forget he could have. Uh, could have won us a penalty. It was I could could have seen that that could have gone either way that penalty decision. Um, so a little bit harsh, but again, yeah, I think I'm wondering how he he develops that sort of uh, rapport with Theo that that maybe it's a little bit easier for Bellerin to do. So I, I thought he did okay. El Nene, Mark uh, Clive. Yeah, I, I I really like him. I I, I thought. I noticed uh, in his first game he looked quite tidy, he looked quite mobile. But yesterday uh, he looked really good across the ground, right? He um he when he presses, he presses with a bit more acceleration. You can see he's adapting physically. Um, I, I he is a proper centre midfielder, right? He's a facilitator. Comes over, gets it, moves it out the other side, passes it forward, follows his pass, challenges his man. I, I really like what he could be. I mean, that's his second game. Uh, I, I'm really liking what I'm seeing. I, I think, you know, he's going to be a big player for us one day. He's got a five and a half year contract, right? So he's going nowhere. In a year's time, I, I think he'll be in that team in some position, right? He'll be in that team and they'll be playing a lot of games. I, I think he's got a big future. And on Chambers, got a quick point on that. Yeah. I, um, I like how he plays that role. I, he played it differently, right? So Bellerin wants to go around the outside. Chambers is smart. He recognises he doesn't be on the outside all the time. So he overlaps and he underlaps and he cuts in. And when he's, what he does really well, he supports the play. So when he, he helps ring the box. So when he comes out to the edge of the box, he looks like a midfielder. He's got quite tidy feet and he moves it and he shifts position. I, he's different, but I quite like that because then it allows gigs, um, gives to be the flyaway fullback, right? The one that goes to the corner flag and brings it back. So I, I think Chambers is, is, Making a good career for himself at Arsenal, I tell you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I was one of the. I mean, I, I've, I've sort of like been saying like, don't, you know, don't hang him out to dry. You know, he's not, he's not, it's not, it's not his fault that fingers played him in twenty thousand different positions. I like it. Short, I think yeah. it's good. I think it's good. Right. Yeah. If I look at a player like, for example, like Isaac Hayden, and really potentially he may have to go and play football elsewhere because Chambers has taken over that utility spot that he maybe could have had. And if I'm looking at squads, I'm thinking, okay, will Isaac Hayden come back in and play centre half or centre midfield for Arsenal? I'm not sure. Chambers has proven he can do that. And he can also play right back. 
I my think he's own, got a good chance. My only gripe with him yesterday was the fact that he kept on cutting in, and so did Theo. And I was thinking, you're cutting him into a centre centre of field where they've got loads of bodies. <laughs> you know, there was they're so congested there. How were happy to to engage us in the centre. You know, they were happy for us to come inside and, and just take the ball yeah. off of us, you know, get bodies in the way, nick the ball away and, and dump it upfield for Dio Mandy to, ch- to to chase lost causes. And I just thought that was a bit of, the, where was the game intelligence there? No, I think I think you're right. Sorry, Mark. I think you're right. I think, um, but I don't think it was Chambers' fault alone. I think if you look at Campbell, he's happier on the inside channels. Right, you look at Welbeck, he's happier, he can go wide, but he wants to be on the inside channels. So everything was pointed in. We had inverted wingers that wanted to come in. We had fullback that really one side didn't massively want to overlap. Right. So um it was very narrow, but I think it was a collective team shape thing rather than um just one player. Okay, let's go to a couple of questions. Mark, did you want to add any picture to that or no, no, no. That's that's. No. Uh, I think Clyde's very, very uh, right people. about about Chambers. Yeah. My my only concern is is that we know that when he's playing right back, if he's got um, a speedy winger getting at him, he he can be got at. So uh, that that would be my only worry. But the guy, you know, I I I, I like the kid. He gets he gets a really hard time off of people, and I think off of just, Andrew. Let's be honest. Off of yeah, Andrew. Well, he's not he's he's not the only one. But <laughs> but you know, the, people need to realise that he is still young. He hasn't had a great deal of football, and he keeps getting asked to come in and play different positions. And and people seem to think that that's really easy. And you know, believe you me, it's not. It's really yeah. not easy at all. Let's go to a couple of questions. Uh, first one from where was he uh, at J N S Y Ret five, and he asks, "Should we have played a strongest possible team or stuck with the team from yesterday?" Hindsight's a perfect science, but what do you think anyway, Clive? No, not for me, right? Um, we're playing. We've got Barcelona on Tuesday, right? The biggest game in world football. Simple as that. There is nothing bigger. You, another reason why the players might have been a bit flat yesterday is that they probably realised that they weren't going to start against Barcelona. Right? So the ones that were there are thinking, OK, apart from the centre-backs, who else is really going to potentially start against Barcelona in that eleven? Right? So they knew that. They know the rules. So they got out there thinking, I'm missing the chance to play against Barcelona. That's a huge night. That's a career night. And so they were a little bit flat maybe at the start and it took us a while to get going right so um it was no surprise that maybe the ones with the most to play for like chambers like like iwobi and like welbeck were probably the brighter players initially right so um i think for me this is it's big boy football right you can't just go out there and play the same 11 all the time because it will matter we're talking about fine margins and that freshness is really important Mark, you've already said before, but just to just to restate your your position on the on the team lineup yesterday. No, I mean I, I can say I I I no no quandaries with uh, with the lineup he started with and the fact that he's got a strong bench that he can bring them on. I know a lot of people will say we'll start with a few stronger players and then you know once you get ahead in the game take them off. But you know then if that doesn't work, you're sort of looking at running players into the the, the ground when you know that this is. It's going to be a big physical effort needed on uh, Tuesday night. You know, maybe if it had been Wednesday, you could have slightly changed it around a little bit. But as it's Tuesday night, I, I, I haven't got a problem with it. And the, as we said, the fact is that team and the subs that you bring on should be strong enough to deal with not even a full strength whole team. OK, so let's, let's look forward briefly before I come back to another listener's question. Briefly, uh, the team uh, who's kind of who's asking questions about possibly being in the starting line. I'm looking at a centre midfield. Who would you put, who's your two man centre midfield, uh, Mark? Uh, for Barcelona? Uh, Coquelin and Ramsey, to be fair. Uh, Clive? Yep. yep. I could pick team right now, mate. All right. And the, on the right hand side, now I'm thinking, for me, I thought Welbeck put in a good audition yesterday and, he's, and you know, he came off after 70, 60 whatever minutes and to save his muscles and whatnot. But I'm thinking that it might, is, is the right hand side as clear cut for you guys? I, for me, I think there's, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's pros and cons for each of the three or four uh, combatants or contestants. I want to find out from you, Mark, first of all, who's the player that you'd have on the right hand side? For me, it's it's a real quandary because I'm not I'm not convinced that you know Theo's done enough to to play there. I'm not convinced the Ox is doing enough to play there. You could you could maybe you know put put Welbeck over there. Uh, I don't know, mate. You know I th- I I think 
probably probably I'd play Theo just to try and um, just to try and push um, Jordi Alva back a bit Clive I think uh, I think you know if it's later in the season I think Welbeck would would start Um, I think you know in my dream eleven, he starts right. He starts right mid, right. So, um, but at the moment, I think the Ox starts, and the fact the Ox started on the bench tells me he's going to start, right. So, uh, I think him and he'll share the game with somebody, depending how the game's going. Um, if he, because he doesn't last games, um, so if we need to hang on to something, I think Welbeck will come on. If we, if we need to get something, I think Theo will come on. Well, well better had two games, short space of time. Oh, we got to look after him, right? I just think we've got to look after him. So, um, for me, the Ox starts and, um, you know, Alexis will play the other side and Giroud starts up front. Um, Ozil, middle two, Coquelin, Ramsey and the, the top, the top back four. Simple. Coolio. All right. All agreed on that. Um, Jack Sessions asks. Does Ox start versus Bar- Barca? And so we were worried about his ability to re- retain the ball. All of Ox, Sanchez and Ramsey lose it cheaply. Mark? No, I mean, he's, he's, he's spot on. Um, you know, Ox's ball retention and his concentration has, has been a worry for me this season. But Theo's not a great deal better. And uh, Ramsey, Ramsey seems to to lose silly passes um, but you know he, at least he's, he uh, he has got the engine that he, he works hard to try and correct any any mistakes that he makes so I, I don't know it's, it is it is a concern when you've got you, when you've got two of the three of those in the side um, Clive's gone with Ox I'm going with Theo but I think it's, it's much of a muchness to be fair I don't yeah. think any of them are, 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 are really cementing down that right right wide spot at the moment Okay, I've uh, got another one from at Walid Omer one five nine. He asks, "Should we drop Alexis versus Barca? He looks so off form at the moment, and may be the perfect impact sub." Clive, I'll let you take that one first. Uh, if we drop Alexis versus Barca, we might as well sell him, right? Because <laughs> can you imagine it? He's playing against his old team. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Point to want- prove. If you want to uh, cheese someone off, uh, how about dropping him, right? Uh, Brendan Rodgers didn't play Steven Gerrard, was it, at Madrid? So he's waited all his career <laughs> to play the Champions League game at Madrid. He fan- he dropped him. I mean, that's suicide, right? He just don't do that. So, um, no, for me, um, he plays. I think it's very important that we have the th- threat of transition out wide and transition speed because we're not going to see that much of the ball. But our ability to transition is going to be our is going to be our game changer, right? And Ozil, Ramsey, Oxley, Chamberlain, Walcott, Alexis, they can all they can all move through the field, and I think that that's going to be really important how we play on Tuesday. Mark, Alexis' form since his return has been hmm, worrying, hasn't it? It has, yeah, it has a little bit, but I mean, it's coincided with a period where we're not, you know, we still haven't been playing great football, and I don't think the team's firing. Um, on all cylinders at the moment, you know we we we've, we've been um, sketchy to say the least. So uh, I think that's that's not helped him. But you know you 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 watch Alexis and you can always tell with him that he he so wants to do well, and that when he's when he's not, you can see how annoyed he's getting with himself and how frustrated he's getting with himself. And I just think. I think what Clive said was spot on. You, you, uh, regardless of the the actual, um, you know, the, the 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 keeping the player on side part of it. I think Alexis is is key to uh, to to to, the, to this game. Uh, again, even if it's just from a point of view of of uh, pushing Danny uh, Danny Alves back, then um, I think it, it's key to have him on there. You know, Alves won't be quite so keen to get forward when he knows that Alexis is around and about, and he will. He, that, that I'm really looking forward to that battle because I think that'll be. Yeah. Um, that will be an excellent battle between those two because you know they both they both want to they both want to get forward. Well, sorry, Alves always wants to get forward, but Alexis might make that a little bit more difficult for him than normal. Very interesting South American battle going on now. Um, moving on to at Welsh Guna ninety five, and he asks: Is a replay really that bad? As most of the first team players won't play. He's looking at El Nene, etc. Who will? 
are you concerned, Clive, about the fact that we've got a replay to add to our oh, six or seven, eight games between now and the this time next month? Ali, I'm a little bit right. We, we seem we seem like a one or one defender light. So we need we need Gabriel back. If we had to make like you know, if we're going to play, it's going to be like a game where you have to play in a short space of time. So we originally need to make eleven changes, and we can make about nine comfortably currently with the current injuries, right? So we need to be able to make eleven. So we might be a right back short or something like that, you know. And I think um, if we can if we can find that extra player to allow us to make the full eleven. It's just another game, right? So, um, and then uh, we, hopefully we'll have enough to uh, to win it, right? So, um, I'm not that worried. But if we get a couple of injuries, especially defensively, it, it, it could be a problem. Mark, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think as Clive says, it's a pain in the ass having to play, you know, pair and and cause yesterday because I think you know they they'll be the starting centre halves on Tuesday. But other than that, I mean, just with it just being one game and with the fact that we. We're probably not going to be playing more than two games in the Champions League uh, mm-hmm. after today. Um, that maybe it's not such a big problem, but you know, it is. A, it, the, the, I think the point is, and, and it was the reason why a lot of people were unhappy yesterday, was that it's, it's a game that we we shouldn't have needed to have to play. You know, it's still it's a tough midweek trip up to Hull. You know, Hull might take it a little bit more seriously. And I mean, I'm not being funny. Steve Bruce didn't want this game. No. You know, the only people the only people who wanted this 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 replay was the whole fans probably just you know to get the Arsenal up to, to to town again, and and the owner who can like gain a bit more money out of our away fans and his own home fans. So other than that, no one really wanted this. So I mean, it was just more I think a question of frustration that we that as we've said we should have had enough in our side to have not uh, to have knocked Hull out yesterday. Coolio, all right. Um, let's move forward. Let's move on to the um, issue with the actual ground, uh, the, the fans, the ground, the ticket exchange, this, that. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier today. I can't remember. I can't see their tweet. But they said they tried to buy free tickets on Friday of ticket exchange for the whole game. Couldn't get through. Um, loads of empty seats yesterday, weren't there? Loads of empty seats. I mean, where I was in block four, I must have been sitting. There was about a row of six empty seats next to me. You know, looking up at club, not surprised there's hardly anyone there, as always, unless it's a big game. But around the ground, it was really, really bad. And I know people, uh, the, the club said there was a attendance figure of, uh, or they sold 59,800 on whatever tickets. But, you know, they've got to, I, 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 why can't, why aren't people accessing these tickets? They said last year, I think it was Gazidis or Ganella said last year, that they're looking at ways of improving ticket exchange and, and box office and whatnot. Uh, and it just doesn't seem to have worked. I mean, surely there must have been people that wanted to come to this game. What did you think? Um, yeah, I mean, look, they, they, there's probably ten to 12,000 seats have been quoted as being empty from people who, uh, you know, who can, who can probably judge it far better than I uh, it's hard to understand. I mean, I'm not being funny, but I mean, it was a Calgary C game, let's be fair. So, you know, 20, 26, 26, 27 quid. So that's a decent price to come and watch the Arsenal play in a home game, in a, you know, in a cup match that they should, should be putting in a good performance and winning. So, you know, you think that there'd be plenty of people that would want to come. Now, conversely, if all these other season ticket holders just decide, oh, you know, I can't be bothered going to this game, why are they not putting it? I don't understand why they're not putting it on ticket exchange. You know, it should be a fairly simple process that doesn't involve any hard work. You say, here's, here's my ticket on Ticket Exchange. You sell it and give me, you know, the, the price of the ticket minus the 10% that Arsenal keep. And so I don't I don't get it. I mean, I know that the supporters groups are very big on trying to improve Ticket Exchange because we have to fill those empty seats. Because apart from anything, if you fill those empty seats... If they're people who can't normally go, they might actually have a bit more, uh, a bit more about them in terms of supporting the team and, exactly, and getting yeah. behind them, you know, rather than the regulars who is who, who it seems are the ones that are uh, generally sitting on their hands chatting about last night's telly. So yeah, they they do need to look at this. But what we've got to remember is at the end of the day, Arsenal have sold those tickets, so they don't really care because they've sold them. So you know, what does it matter? Um, Clive, what, what, have you got any thoughts on this? Well, I do actually. I um. It's it's just down to our, our fan base, right? So we've we've got our, you know we pay the highest prices in, in in the world, and and that drives a certain fan base. You know the average age of our fan group was it is it north of fifty? 
right? So if you're like in your middle age and you've got a few quid, you're earning your money now, 40, 50 quid, not turning up, bothered, not bothered, right? If I'm 19, I'm at college, that's a lot of money to me, right? So um, if I'm, you know, if I'm middle age and I'm working, I'm thinking, well, I just can't fancy today. They're going to move it to 12 o'clock. That's taking away my Saturday night out. I just, uh, I, I just make a choice, especially when the biggest game in the world is like three days later right people are just making choices as, we, as we're doing in all parts of our life right so we have we have dictated this audience by the ground and the pricing model right so i think we've got to move almost to a system where if the seat is not taken up by a certain time it's immediately gone you know almost like we've got to do something else even to go to ticket exchange is too much bother for some people right so um you just need to say just a simple system to say, I won't be taking up my seat. You can use it, right? Just simple as that, you know, and um, and make it you know a very simple electronic system that says you can take it, right? And then they and they resell it, right? And that's it. And uh, you've got to do something like that because we're losing a generation of fans that could that want to go in that basically can't make it because the seat isn't officially there to be used. And I think you make a good point about the, the, the youngsters, especially students who are struggling for money. I mean, they're not going to pay able to pay, I would imagine, £64 minimum ticket to go and see Barcelona, but £26.50 they probably could stretch to. I, I was chatting to a guy called um, Loving the Arsenal at four, K4YN3R, and he says, any Arsenal match can be a sellout if Arsenal market them in the right way. Why can't Ticket exchange go on general sale through the box office. Ultimately, box office buy the tickets off the owners and then resell them, even if it's at a discount, for the good for the good of the fans. Subsidised hashtag subsidised. And, and then she walked came in and said, "Should there should be a donation a, a donate system as well? It, they may be more inclined to sell that way." What do you think, Mark? For those two points. I think, well, I think they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're very good points, and and they're all things that the the fan groups are trying to get the club to address, and you know, and all you get, what you get is you get Ivan Gazidis telling us that you know we've made improvements to ticket exchange, but we still see the same old problems that it seems to be hard to sell those tickets. Now maybe they're not doing enough to ensure that the people put their tickets on on the exchange or make them available, um, but you also, I mean, like there's there's four four of us sit in a row and the the number of times that any of our seats have been empty in the 10 years since we've been at the Emirates is you count on one hand and that's generally due to unforeseen circumstances you know we always make sure someone can go uh, even even on Twitter you, you see how easy it is to to get to get tickets available to people and there's never any indication you know apart from a few scummy twats there's never any indication of of uh, people selling tickets for more than face value so you know, it, I think actually the fans do more to try and get the tickets used than the bloody clubs helping us to do. Yeah. So they need to, they really need to look at this and and work harder to to try and make them available and get those seats filled up and give give people the opportunity to go to games. Particularly when you consider that game yesterday and how terrible the atmosphere was. Exactly. It really could have done with a, you know, those ten thousand people who, who would have who would have made a lot more noise and been a bit more excited about being there, regardless of you know, how, how dire the performance may have been. Absolutely agree with that. And I also agree with Clive, you know, the Clive's just about making, just simplifying the system. I mean, why, you know, why is it so complex? Why does it have to fucking crash? You know, you know, I, 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 I'm not an IT guy. I'm not a systems guy. Clive, you're more into IT than I am. Well. It's got to be easy, right? It's got to be so easy for that middle-aged Arsenal fan that can afford these tickets to say, okay, my ticket's available, and then just stick the money in my account. I don't care. I'm not even going to look. Do you know what I mean? You do what you like of it, but put just wire the money straight back into my account. Done. It's got to be easy. It's got to be a simple text or something that's really easy to make the people realise that their ticket can be reused. If it's in any way complex, they won't be bothered. Mm. They're more interested in keeping that ticket into the family for the games like Tuesday, because you know what those nights are like, right? They are special, right? They're worth the price of the ticket on its own for the whole season, right? So you, those nights can't be missed. And that's what they care about. Indeed. Um, Dominic Laguna says, <clears throat> should Arsenal compensate fans if the game against Swansea is to be rearranged? Clive. Uh, I don't think so. 
Uh, I just think it's if if we didn't have to compensate those Leicester fans and all those Arsenal fans and wait to come over for that game that couldn't make it, why is this one any different? Right. So uh, it's the nature of the beast. We just finished watching Man City put out a, a inexperienced team because the BBC moved the game one day. You know, it's happened to us. TV is the paymaster. You know, it's going to get even worse next year. I'm afraid. Right. That's the deal. We signed the deal with the devil, right? And that's where we are. Right. So um, that's it. Uh, Mark? No, I mean, you, Clive's hit the nail on the head there, mate. You know, you sold our soul a long time ago to the TV companies, so therefore, you know, they will uh, dictate what, what when games are played and obviously then managers have to consider their options. Um, if I was a Man City fan uh, today, you know, he's probably spent a lot of money travelling down to uh, to London to for, you know, what is a big cup game and seeing the team that was put out. You know, whilst I can understand the, the the reasons behind it in terms of them travelling to Kiev later in the week, you know, I wouldn't exactly be overjoyed uh, having to watch uh, a team play that, that with the amount of youth players that I wouldn't expect Arsenal to put out in, in a, a League Cup match at home. Um, it's it's difficult. I mean, I, I think to a certain extent, if a game is rearranged, anyone who's already bought a ticket has the opportunity to uh, to probably uh, try and get a refund on it anyway. I, I I think because you know it's hardly their fault it's been rearranged, and therefore if you now can't go, you should be able to to get a refund. But you know, at the end of the day, we all know how much the uh, the football clubs and the football authorities care about the fans. And it's interesting that Leicester City fans didn't really. St- Put up much of a struggle or fight uh, last weekend, did they? I mean, there was a lot of talk about protesting about the rearrangement of uh, the Arsenal Leicester fixture, but there was it was really a non-event as well. So maybe there's a I bit think, of that. Uh, Go on. Uh, the Leicester game, right? There's a bit of protest before the game. When we watched that game and then saw how it ended, there wasn't many people talking about our oh, shame it got moved. Do you know what I mean? It's all about <laughs> it's all about the entertainment, right? For both teams, it's a fan, fantastic event. Right, so um, my, I really feel for City today. Right, we get to a situation that's hurt us in the past. When the Champions League kicks in, and what do we do? We throw the Premier Cup competition right around the same time, and we then put in replays. I mean, it is we got to ask ourselves, right? What are we doing to help the you know the top clubs in Europe? We're just not helping them. That's right? a good. That's a good. Go, go, go on, Clive. Go. On. We're not helping them. Yeah. Man City will be judged on what they do in Europe. They've spent millions and millions over the last four or five years. They've won two leagues and they will be judged. They haven't qualified even for the latter stages for a few years. It's all about Europe for them and the Premiership. And that's where we are. And what do we do? We throw in an FA Cup, right? And uh, the, the FA Cup has got to look at its scheduling and its timing. And I don't give a monkey's about tradition. The game has changed. The financial demographic of the game has made that competition slightly less important. So we have to decide how we want it to fit into our British game, right? So we need to put it into a place in the a timing in the league season where it can be given the priority it deserves. And for me, the issue is the League Cup. The League Cup is well positioned, right? And um. And what's happened is you can't do the two at the same time. Does this country need two cup competitions? We're the only ones, right? So um, maybe that's got to be looked at, right? But um, that's just my opinion. But um, I, I think one cup competition is, is more than enough. Uh, uh, Mark, well, Clive's made a, a, a number of points. I want, the first point I want to bring you to is, is, is sort of like, and tie it in with what Wenger said the other day, was he believes in the romance of the cup and we should keep FA Cup replays. But... Premier League obviously want to <clears throat> ring fence, uh, you know, they want to sort of help our Premier clubs uh, progress in, in, in Europe, not least because by 2018 we might lose a place. So it's in our, it's in our benefit, it's in, it's in their interest or a club's interest to, to, to go as far and progress in Europe as possible. Are you a more of a romanticist or are you sort of more modern day and think, look, let's do away with the replays or at least do, as Clive said, do we need the League Cup? have one less cup competition is protect our, our premier clubs in Europe. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a great point about the league cup, you know, do you need the league cup? But you, you know, next week we'll see if how important it is to city and Liverpool when they play it. And you know, possibly for Liverpool, they might be looking at that as their entry into Europe next season, which the Europa league, they may or may not want to mm. uh, end up in Obviously, again. Who knows? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think it's, it's difficult because, 
Yeah, we've had the League Cup for for you know 30, 40 years, however long, and people will then say, well, if you don't, you know, if you don't have the Premier League clubs in it, um, it's disrespecting it. And obviously, t- to be perfectly honest, the only clubs that are actually that fussed about not having that many games are the four that end up in the Champions League, and that's four of the same sort of five or six clubs every year. So again, you know, I think from from like sixth, seventh place in the league down, they all they all would love to be in the League Cup, particularly without the top four, five, six teams, because it would give them a good chance of winning it. And you know, we have to remember that for them, this is a it's a trophy, and and these clubs don't get a chance to win a trophy that often. So uh, it's it's difficult. Um, as to FA Cup and the replays. Well, let's put it this way. I'm not a big fan of replays today. Uh, mm. Certainly, a, a, an even an even less of a fan than I was at three, uh, 12:45 yesterday. So I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I think maybe I think uh, Tim Stillman said earlier on today. Maybe you could say that after the fifth round, uh, not replays on the head, so that you know from the from yeah. round five six. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's it, you know, it's a one-off game, you know, but all the way through before that, maybe you could stick with the replays because there's less congestion and obviously they're played at a time that's uh, where the Champions League hasn't kicked in a, kicked in yet. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good thing. And also for those smaller clubs, to get that replay is like a life blood, right? So, um, and I think but it's only in the third and fourth round. And once it gets to the fifth round, you know, not even, not just the Champions League, but the league games become events, right? Leicester's game against Norwich in a week's time, that's as big as any cup game, right? That's an event, right? So um, we're now selling events every week. You know, some of the times the Premier League games as big as the FA Cup final, it feels like to me, right? So um, we've got to protect the event as it gets into the last third and decide which one is our out. We're literally, com- we've got two competing competitions, basically. And the Premier League has shown by playing... Premier League games after three or four days after a third round game, they're saying to the FA, we don't care about your competition. We're going to put a league game fixture in just after it. So they're competing, right? And we're hurting because we're not just competing in this, but can compete in the Champions League. Mm, okay, cool, Leo. All right, let's move on to the um, ominous Barcelona game coming up. Um, Clive, I want to start with you. How do you think Arsenal should approach this game. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. To be honest, um, we're, we're, we're playing the best possession team in the world. But you know, I, I think Barcelona give you the ball a lot more than they used to. And I, and I think that we're going to be, you know, we're not going to have it as much as we're used to. But, you know, the teams of, you know, Pep Guardiola's team, I mean, you were lucky to have it for 5%, it felt like. You know, um, I mean, you were just exhausted, just trying to get out, get your head up, let alone get out of your box. You know, so um, I, I feel with this team, they're a bit more hardworking. Players like Rakitic has offered some physicality to them. Um, I think um, they still got the three boys up front, obviously, and they're better than ever. But for me, I just think Arsenal need to... I think our our defenders will dictate how we play. I, I see us playing with a with a slightly deeper defence, and I see us springing. And if we can get up the pitch and play some good possession, I, I see Giroud in the air being a real threat. Right, so um, I think Giroud could be the man. I really do. I think uh, physically, he's like no centre forward that they face on a week to week basis. So um, it's our ability to connect with him. And that's why I see us having fast running, hard running, distance running midfielders on um, Tuesday night. And I think our ability to get close to Giroud, to get him to service is going to be key. Mark, um, the defence, as Clive said, will be, will be probably key and, and how we protect the defence. Uh, Gabriel, I'm, I'm sure well, a lot of people say that Gabriel's inclusion in the team before he got injured was really with an eye to you know, playing against the MSN. Now that he's out of the team, um, we've really got to make sure that um, Mertesacker Saka and, and Co are not exposed. Do you see us playing the same sort of game that we played against uh, Bayern Munich at home, where we sort of like we were really disciplined and sort of sprung on them, um, hit them on the break quite often, or when we could, 
Uh, and and even though we've got a lot of distance runners, I mean, we said earlier on that there's, there's quite a few players in that team that are quite profligate with the ball. How important is it to make sure that when we have the ball, we recycle it properly and, and take care of it? Really, really love the ball. How important are these elements? Well, they they are they're, they're vitally important. You know, I mean, I think we we have to play uh, a bit deeper. You know, we can't let people um, get a Mertesacker because you know I think everybody knows that that's the that's the the link that they'll be looking to exploit. So uh, we we've got to be really really disciplined, and I think our back four can be. You know, they proved against Bayern that they can be. Um, and then yeah, if, if we can't keep giving away possession cheaply, you know, we've got to manage to hold on to it. You know, we've got to make sure that it's 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 players like Özil that have got got the ball a bit more than than uh, certain other players who, who yeah. do tend to tend to give it away a bit more. So uh, I just hope we don't. You know, I mean, there's you, you've got the big you've got the card display and everyone's going to be up for it. You know, I'm sure the atmosphere is going to be really really buzzing. You know, I'm just hoping that that doesn't transmit to the team and make them too carried away and just go too gung-ho early. I think we need to stay with them. I think we need to keep our shape very, very tight. And then, as Clive says, try and break, try and play play off Giroud and get the players, you know, in and around Giroud, who's been doing really well lately, and uh, and then just, just see what we can get out of the game. Um, because I certainly think, whilst whilst I'm not overly confident of us progressing... I'd certainly th- would think that we can get a decent result at home, you know, and then just uh, try and see what we can do away. Um, and to that point, Mark, I mean, what's a decent result at home to you? I think it's definitely not losing. I, I think, you know, I, I can't see any reason why we, we can't uh, not lose this game. You know, ideally, I want us to win it, of course. And I think we can. I think we can definitely uh, we can do what we did to, to Bayern. Uh, you know, all, all, whilst everybody goes on about the three up top, you know, it only requires them to have uh, have a, a, a quiet game uh, and, and for us to, to shackle them well. You know, to to, to stop them from uh, from doing too much damage. Um, and outside of those three, I'm I'm not overly concerned about the you know the goal threat so as long as we can deal with them i think we can certainly we can nick a win um so that i think but i don't want you know i don't want to lose it i mean i know if we lose it people will then say well at least it means we can just go out to barcelona and it'll probably be um you know a maybe a slightly weakened team and barcelona will probably just do about enough as they need to do to progress but i don't really want to be in that situation i'd like i'd like barcelona to have to turn up at a new camp you know certainly for the sake of Sort of, to play yeah, exactly, exactly. You yeah. know, and, and put a decent side out and really try and give them a game out of there. So let's let's make sure that we're we're nice and tight and steady and don't do anything stupid. Uh, Clive, I just asked Mark um, what, what he sees as a decent result at home. Uh, what how, what do you think is a decent result for us, realistically? I, I, f- I think it's really key that we get Barcelona to play in areas of the pitch they don't want to play. Right, so that's the key thing. You know, one of my favourite games is um, well, Bayern Munich passed over the first leg of the new camp and what Bayern Munich did to get them to play in their other areas was was fantastic the one-on-one for the first 20 I can't wait to see this game I think for me I just want the second leg to mean something I don't want it to be something that we don't have to show up for right so anything a draw a one nil, a nil nil will be fine the second leg's got to mean something because I think there's enough talent in our team to hurt them, but it's got to mean something, right? And um, and that is a game where the big wide spaces of New Camp, a, a big strong runner like Theo Walcott could be really useful on, on the wide. And I play the opposite at home, but I, I think anything, as long as it means something, we're not 2 0 down, then that would be good. Cool, yeah. All right, so to that end, um, predictions. Let's <laughs> start with you, Mark. Predictions for Tuesday night's game. He's so scared. <laughs> he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't want to put his neck on the block. What about you, Mark? Oh, Clive, sorry, did I say? Yeah, I think it's going to be a draw. I think it's going to be a 2-2. A 2-2 draw. And I think that's enough to make us interested in the in the second leg. To be honest, I, I just, I'm looking for the matchup. I can't wait to see how we look against them. I think we've got a much stronger team than we'd had years ago. And um, you know we've got two, you know, two or three proper world-class players now. So um, 
and they're going to look for these nights as career nights. Oh, I can't, I can't wait for the matchup. All right, going back to Mark yeah. predictions. Sorry, sorry, mate. Yeah, I was hiding behind the back of the sofa. Um, I don't know. As I said, I think if if we're smart, if we if we if we're disciplined and we're smart in exactly the way that Clive said, I think we can uh, win this game two one. Um, my concern is that sometimes our team doesn't play very smart. Uh, in which case I would see us losing 3-1. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing to mention. It'd be nice to just have 11 men in these games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, seriously, right, we go into these games and we all get excited and then we go down. And I think, oh, man. And then it's like, it is a behind the set each job. And it's never a true matchup. So in these big, big moments, we tend to derail it some way. I'm just happy to be nil-nil at half-time with 11 men on the pitch and let's see what they've got. Yeah, indeed. indeed. All right, so that kind of just about right. So I apologise for any people that um, I didn't get around to answer questions. Those are at Zeus Cannon and uh, who else is it? One Touch Footy. Possibly we'll, we'll, we'll cover your questions next week. Uh, before we go, I want to I wanna just remind you all, everybody... All that you listeners that you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, at the site on goonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonagoonago